अतो हेतो रहेतो यूनोर्मान मुदंचती फ्रॉम द एबसेंस ऑफ अ कॉज इन द एबसेंस ऑफ अ कॉज च च एंड एंड यू नो हो नो हो ऑफ द यंग कपल ऑफ द यंग कपल मानह मानह एंगर एंगर उदंचति उदंचति अपीयर्स अपीयर्स ट्रांसलेशन परपोर्ट बाय हिज डिवाइन ग्रेस एसी भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी श्री प्रभुपाद ट्रांसलेशन The progress of loving affairs between a young boy and a young girl is like the movement of a snake. On account of this, two types of anger arise between a young boy and a girl: anger with cause and anger without cause. Purport: During the Rasa dance, one form of Krishna was between every two gopis, but by the side of Shrimati Radha Rani, there was only one Krishna. Although this was the case, Shrimati Radha Rani still manifested disagreement with Krishna. This verse is from the Ujjwal Nila Mani Shringar Ved Kathan Kathan One Zero Two, written by Shri Rupa Goswami. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gyan Anjani Shala Kaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmay Shri Guru Ve Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya. कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्यदेशिणे वाचाकलपतरूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पति पावनेभ्य वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण so today i'll be talking about the last part of this series on appreciating gaudiya vaishnavism so thank all of you for your patience in tolerating me for 7 days this has been quite a long journey in a sense and this is a very exalted subject which i'll be talking today i'll just mention it very briefly for us to get an, get a sense of what it is we cannot actually taste it but like yesterday we discussed about the about uh, parakya bhav which is at least we intellectually understand it so that we can defend it 
So today I'll be talking about the Viraha Prema, the love in separation. So this verse, Prabhupada is given, it is being quoted from the Chait, from the Ujjwal Nilamana. So now, there is an interesting, uh, interesting aspect to Chaitanya Charita Amrit, which is a, like a balance between the transcendental and the historical. So here, if we consider this verse, Prabhupada is saying, this is, this is from the Ujjwal Nilamani. Now, Ujjwal Nilamani is a book written by Shri Rupa Goswami. And that book is written after the conversation between Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Ramanand Rai has taken place. So this conversation between Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Ramanand Rai is happening in, in Puri. Rupa Goswami is primarily based in Vrindavan and he's writing his various books over there. And of course he comes to Puri and he tells Maharaj, tells Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and other Vaishnavas about his book and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is very pleased with him. And he tells, uh, he, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu feels that he has understood his heart and blesses him profusely. All the Vaishnavas also bless him. So still if we consider historically the date in which actually the book was written, that is later than what uh, the conversation when Ramanandra and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took place. So the question comes up that how could Ramanandra be quoting from a book which was not yet written? So this argument is used by some skeptical scholars to challenge the historicity of Chaitanya Charitamrita. There are many verses of Chaitanya Charitamrita which are actually quotations, not many, but quite a few, which are uh, quotations from books that were written, written later. So the understanding is that actually it is <coughs> not that the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Aramandra are quoting from those books. Rather, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Aramandra spoke those things and later they were quoted in those books. Now, in, in today's world, there is often a great tendency to, uh, to claim copyright violation. You know, if I take one sentence, if I take around 30 words from somebody's book, some, even not in 30 words, more than 10, 12 words if I take, and I don't, if it's exactly the same word, if I don't quote it, it is from this person, this becomes, it becomes a problem. Or oh, there are online software, they're called plagiarism checkers. And they, uh, whenever any students submit any papers for academic checking, their professors, they put in plagiarism checkers, and they check how much of it is your original work. It does not become a problem. Now, in the tradition, actually, it's implicitly understood that whatever I'm speaking, I am speaking what I have learned from the previous Acharyas. So, therefore, actually speaking, even if one doesn't explicitly quote that this particular passage is from this particular author, that's not considered a, a deficiency. Shri Prabhupada Chaitanya Charita Amrit is largely, much, most, most of his purports are derived from the Gaudiya Bhashya of Chaitanya Charita Amrit written by Bhakti Sudhan Thakur. Now, but interestingly, Prabhupada doesn't quote that book in his commentary. Although his commentary is almost entirely, except for the parts related to scorn, almost his entire commentary is based on that book. But he doesn't quote. Now, this is not a deficiency because Prabhupada is attributing everything to his spiritual master. So, we don't have to get too caught up in historicity in these cases. So, in a sense, today people talk about copyright, but in the tradition, you know, to copy is the right, in a sense. You are actually meant to take from the previous acharyas and repeat that. So, Prabhupada dedicates his book to his spiritual masters. So, Rupa Goswami dedicates his book to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And if he is quoting from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's associates, the point is not that Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami is quoting later. Rather, he is quoting something which is not historical. Rather, it is historical, but Rupa Goswami has put in his book. And here the reference is given to that book. So, going beyond these textual issues, let's focus on the theme, what is going on. So, yesterday I talked about how parakiya bhav, where love and separation, sorry, uh, where love out of wedlock, that intensifies the attraction towards Krishna. 
Now, this is not the only thing. Here it is said that <coughs> in the relationship between uh, young boy and young girl, where it refers ultimately to Radha and Krishna, there is anger with cause and there is anger without cause. Now, at one level, this may seem very odd. You know? We may think in the spiritual world there should be no anger at all. Kama, Krodha, Lova, all these are characteristics of this material world. Krishna says that they are the gates to hell, lust, anger and greed. So how can anger be present in the spiritual world? And not only that, anger without a cause. So how does that work? Actually, when we, there are two ways to understand this. That the word Kama, which is often used, Gopya Kama, in the seventh canto it is described, that different people attain perfection in different ways. Bhayat Kamsa Dvesha Chaidyada Yandrapaha it is <clears throat> so that Kamsa, he attained perfection because he was constantly thinking of Krishna in fear. Shishupal attained perfection because he was thinking about Krishna in envy. And it is said the gopis were thinking about Krishna in calm. Now what the, the word Kama normally refers to lust. But lust is not the only meaning of karma, or rather lust in that negative sense, where it is an enemy to be given up. That is not the only sense in which it is used. So, for example, Krishna himself says, Dharma viruddho bhuteshu kamo smi bharata shabha. That I am, uh, I am karma that is not contrary to dharma. So here what, what is Krishna referring to? He is talking about the four purusharthas. Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha. So Kama, which is a part of the Purusharthas, Purusha Artha means these are the worthy goals for human beings. So Dharma is a goal for human being, Artha is a goal for human being, Kama is a goal for human being, and ultimately Moksha is a goal for human beings. And the word Kama is also used in a general sense of desire with no negative connotation associated with it, with it. in the Bhagavatam also. <coughs> It is said that, that when Maharaj Yudhishthir was ruling, he was his rule, so please the Lord and please nature, whose Lord Krishna, the Krishna is, that nature showered Kamam Bavarsha Parjanyo. Parjanya is rains which fulfill Kam. And we need various resources for fulfilling our desires. Sarva kama dugha mahi. So rain fulfilled the desires by showering profusely. And earth fulfilled the desires by providing the necessities. So here the word kama is used in terms of whatever is desirable, not necessarily in terms of sinful. So the word kama can have different meanings in different contexts. And when it is said gopya kama, that the gopis are attracted towards Krishna with kama. Hmm. What does it mean? At one level, now the gopis are in a female form, Krishna is in a male form, and the gopis are attracted to Krishna, Krishna is attracted to the gopis. So the Prabhupada explains in Krishna book also, that actually karma is used to indicate the intensity of the desire. So there are some, uh, some scholars academic scholars who try to, they want to defend Hinduism or Vaishnavism from the criticism of immorality. And they say, oh, this is Radha Krishna's past tense, they're immoral. And they want to defend it from the criticism of immorality. And that's why they say that actually this Leela is metaphorical. This whole idea of Krishna and Radha performing uh, Ras Leela and then in the culmination of Ras Leela they unite with each other, that is simply metaphorical. That represents the jiva uniting with Brahman. So Krishna is Brahman, the gopis are the jiva, and then they unite. Now this is this sort of terminology is not talked about anywhere by our acharyas. Not in the acharyas, in the scriptures. We don't talk about it in this way. So their argument is they also accept the five rasas. So yes, you know, first so <coughs> they say that. You know, if you see who is close to God, somebody who thinks that God is a servant, God is my master, I am the servant, 
person is somewhat close to God, but there's a big distance. Somebody who thinks, so there's Dasyaras, and there's Sakharas. If you think of God as a friend, you're coming closer. Think of God as your child, you're coming closer still. Then if you think of God as your, uh, God as your lover, you're coming closer still. And as you keep coming closer and closer to the God, the culmination is when you come closest to God by becoming one with Him. So what they do is they talk about the five rasas and then beyond the five rasas, the culmination of the relationship of Krishna and gopis, they say is in the union and that they talk about as the union of the jiva with the, with the Brahman. Now this is, this is a misunderstanding because the Bhagavatam time and time and talks about how Krishna is the Parabrahma. He is the Supreme Brahman. He is not a manifestation of the Brahman. Rather, the Brahman is a manifestation of him. He does not come from the Brahman. Brahman comes from him. So now their attempt to try to defend Krishna is, oh, you know, Krishna is not immoral. That, that intention may be fine. But the way they try to explain it, by saying that this all refers to just metaphorical merging of the jiva with the Brahman. Oh, that completely uh, undermines and almost destroys the exaltedness of the love of the gopis for Krishna. So Krishna Leela has elements of metaphor within it. But it is not itself metaphorical. It is transcendental. Metaphorical means it's just symbolic. It represents something in an indirect, representative, comparative way. It's not like that. It, it is actually the highest reality. Now, in addition to being a highest reality, it can, rep it can also represent something else. So yes, as, uh, how the gopis are ready to give up everything for Krishna's sake. No, so the gopis are obstructed by, by their family members, by, other, by so many other people. And still, in spite of all, they just leave everything and come towards Krishna. Now that act can be seen metaphorically to, as an example of how we need to give up everything to attain Krishna. So for example, in Chaitanya Charitam, there's the example of, of Raghunath Das Goswami. When he wanted to go towards Lord Chaitanya, he was obstructed. Just as the gopis were obstructed when they were trying to go to Krishna, Raghunath Das Goswami was obstructed. And Raghunath Das Goswami, despite all the obstacles, he circumvented somehow intelligently and he ultimately attained Lord Chaitanya. And he did not merge with Lord Chaitanya. He was eternally a servant of Lord Chaitanya. And externally speaking, you know, if we see the kind of uh, mental imagery that comes in our mind, when we say, think of the gopis leaving at midnight to go to meet Krishna, and somebody renouncing the world to meet another renunciate. They're completely different imagery. The mind starts thinking about sensuality whenever we may think about gopis going to Krishna. But when you think about the, uh, our Raghunath and Goswami, or renunciates like him, renouncing the whole world to go to the Lord, there, actually, the principle is the same. The manifestation will be different. The principle is the same. The intention is the same. The intensity is similar. So, so we can learn lessons from how the gopis surrender to Krishna. But it is not metaphorical. It is metaphysical. Metaphysical means it refers to a reality beyond the physical. It is a higher reality. And in that reality, whatever is required for enhancing the sweetness that is there. So karma refers to Normally refers to lust. It can, in a positive sense, refer to desire. Uh, basically, the soul has an innate power to desire. And the way the soul uses that power determines whether that soul will go upwards towards God or downwards away from God. Now, when it is said gopya kama, that means the natural power of desiring that the soul has that power is something which we all have. And the gopis directed their power intensely, wholeheartedly, undistractedly towards Krishna. And by that, they attain Krishna. So is karma present in the spiritual world? Karma, in the sense that it is selfish desire for bodily gratification, that is not present at all. But karma, in the sense of desire itself, the desire by which one is attracted to one's Lord, 
by the age one gets very deeply intimately connected with the lord that is definitely there and similarly anger is also there so anger as it been the crowd has mentioned earlier the point of anger see like we discussed earlier is maya present in the spiritual world there is the illusion which makes us go away from krishna that is mahamaya and there is the illusion which takes us closer towards krishna and that is yoga maya so in yoga maya the illusion is one doesn't think of krishna as god one thinks of krishna as just a, such a lovable person he is the lovable lord of vrindavan and i want to love him i want to devote myself to him so that means kama and krodha they are when they are disconnected from krishna they become forces of illusion but when kama and krodha are directed towards krishna they can actually intensify one's connection with krishna narottam das thakur in one of his songs he says that he talks about how not just how it happens in the spiritual world how it can be done even in this world he says kama krishna karma arpane krodh bhakta dveshi jane he says if we have kama if we have strong desire a desire is what energizes us if a person has no desire they will not do anything so we have desire normally our desire gets attracted uh, gets connected with the sense objects and then we desire the sense objects very intensely feverishly but if we can just channel that power of desire kama krishna karma arpane if you can direct the desire towards doing work for krishna and offering the work to krishna then that kama can become very powerful that can become a become a become a tool by which we can do enormous service to krishna in fact shri prabhupad in a sense what differentiated him from many of his god brothers uh, in the gaudiya math was his strong desire many of his god brothers were also very exalted vaishnavas but among them none of them had that burning desire to carry out the mission of lord chaitanya to spread lord chaitanya's message all over the world to share krishna bhakti all over the world at one level what the meeting between bhakta sanan sai thakur and shri prabhupa their first meeting is extraordinary do the first meeting itself jay bhakta sanan sai thakur told you we are a young educated man why don't you travel in the western world and preach lord chaitanya's message how many of us in a first meeting with a new person are going to speak such a thing we have we love speak such a thing it was ex- at one level it's extraordinary but at another level this instruction to speak to the to preach in the western world was not something which shri prabhupad gave so bhakta sanan sai thakur gave only to shri prabhupad and it was a instruction that he given to many of his disciples in fact for his uh, disciples who went abroad to he came to uk at that time mohan maharaj and ah uh, antit uh, maharaj actually they were fully funded by his, the spiritual master the stay was funded everything was arranged for them so the point was that it was this the context in which prabhupad got the instruction in the first meeting that was very special but the instruction itself was not special the instruction was like an instruction given to practically all his leading disciples what distinguished prabhupad was that he took it up he had that calm not calm in the sensual sense but calm in the sense of desire he had the desire to fulfill the desire of his spiritual master so bhakti is not so much about giving up desire as it is about taking up desires you know we have to give up the desire for worldly enjoyment but more than that we have to take up the desire to serve the lord and the more we take up the desire to serve the lord the more other desires will automatically go away so actually lower desires cannot be driven out from our consciousness but they can be crowded out you know that means if i say i will not think of this i will not think of this i will not think of you can't do that you I mean, think about it not thinking about something is also thinking about it only you know somebody say i won't think about alcohol but then that they're thinking about alcohol so we can't drive out desires but we can we can crowd them out once you take up more and more desires to serve krishna then the lower desires get crowded out 
So in that sense, karma can be channeled positively. So this is karma as a generic desire. Now for the gopis, that same generic desire that I serve Krishna, that comes in a specific way. By the Lord's arrangement, they are in a female form, they are souls. And you know, sometimes if we just have this too much of a sensual connotation, that the, oh, the gopis are female, Krishna is male, and what are they doing? If there is too much sensual connotation, then we can just try to shift the vision back to a previous life. Now, we know that many of the gopis were actually, not all, in the, <coughs> many of the gopis were actually, uh, they were rushis in their previous life. And Lord Ram had come to the forest with Sita and he was performing pastimes with Sita. At that time, the rushis saw and they were attracted to the Lord. And the Lord said that, I'll accept you in the next life. So then those rushis became <coughs> became the gopis in the spirit next life. So this means that actually now if we see the Lord hugging a rishi, you know, we won't feel anything odd about it. Yes, it's, it's affection. But when we see that okay, there's a female form and a male form, immediately you now we start what is going on over here? The mind starts becoming a little skeptical. But from the Lord's perspective, they're all in devotees. Of course, different devotees have different flavors in their relationship. But the point is, for the gopis, by the arrangement of the rasa in which they are serving, they have a female form, the Lord has a male form. And they serve Him according to the form that they have, according to the disposition that they have. And the, so for them, gopya kamad. Kama doesn't refer to sensual, de deluding desire the way it is here. What it refers to is that the gopis, they, all their power of desire, is used to serve Krishna. And then all of us will serve Krishna according to the resources that we have. Now, Brahmana will serve Krishna in a different way, Akshatriya will serve Krishna in a different way, Avaishya will serve Krishna in a different way. Similarly, a soul is in a female body, will serve Krishna in a particular way. So, from, so the important principle is to see the service. And from that perspective, the gopis are the topmost devotees because they are offering everything for the service of Krishna. And there is karma, and like that, there is krodha also. So, in that, anger is often what brings <coughs> animation, brings life into a relationship. In fact, we know in the 10th canto, there is a description of how Krishna wanted to see Rukmini get angry. And he was trying and trying when he, uh, when first Satyabhama, when first Narasimhi came and gave a Parijat flower to Krishna. Krishna gave it to Rukmi. Actually, Narasimhi gave it to Rukmi as chief queen. And then Satyabhama got annoyed with it. And Krishna went to the heavens. Satyabhama, she asked for Parijat and Krishna gave a whole Parijat tree to her. And then now when Krishna expected that if I come and meet Rukmini, Rukmini will be annoyed. And she will ask for something. And she did not ask anything. So, Krishna wanted Rukmini to get angry. And he wanted to see Rukmini's anger. And that's why he started speaking, there's a whole chapter that talks between Krishna and Rukmini, where he's trying to goad Rukmini. He says, actually, you know, you made a big mistake. You should not have married me. You are a wealthy princess and I'm just a cowherd boy. And anyway, I'm not interested in worldly affairs. You know, my devotees are also renounced and I am also renounced like that. And even now it is not too late. You know, you can, if you want, if you want to correct your mistake and marry someone else, you can marry. Now for Kumani, it was shocking. You know, she did not have that conception that actually the Lord is joking with me. She thought actually Krishna wants to, to leave me and she fainted. And then what happened? Krishna immediately consoled her, you know, he brought some water, sprinkled on it, and he told her, I was just joking, I just wanted to see you get angry. And then when Rukmini understood this, then Rukmini got angry. And then she refuted all of Krishna's arguments. So, the point is, if there is a stability in a relationship, then anger can also add a flavor to the relationship. Anger, if if the relationship itself is not stable, then anger may break the relationship. But if the relationship is stable, then anger adds some flavor, adds some variety, adds some excitement in the relationship. And what is it? Anger with cause and anger without cause. What it means is that sometimes there's something wrong because of which a gopi may get angry with Krishna and Krishna has to pacify her. 
or sometimes we get angry without any reason also but that is also for the pleasure of krishna because that become that brings spice that brings flavor to the relationship of krishna with the gopis in the gopal champu it is described that actually how the gopis of vrindavan are the queens in dwarka the same gopis expand to become the queens in dwarka but significantly there is a very striking difference talked about over there it is said that actually satyabhama expand sorry we have radharani manifest in dwarka as satyabhama and rukmini is actually a manifestation of chandravali so <clears throat> radharani is the topmost devotee and she is manifesting as the second queen satyabhama and chandravali is manifesting as the first queen as uh, why is that So actually, the description is it's in terms of Rupa Goswami, Jiva Goswami describes the Gopal Chandra. He says it's in terms of mood. If we see, he gives the, in the Ujjwal Nila Mani, the example is given that hmm, that actually Krishna and the Gopis, both of them, they have a different relationship with each other. And not all Gopis have the same relationship. So there are some Gopis who try to please Krishna. and there are some gopis whom krishna tries to please whom krishna tries to please so the gopis who try to please krishna they, their leader is chandravali so they are always trying to serve they are always trying to please they are always humble oh, whatever you want krishna whatever you do it so if krishna they are supposed to meet krishna and krishna doesn't come on time then and krishna comes very late i say okay you know thank you at least you came that is the mood of those gopis but when radharani is the leader of the other group of gopis whom krishna has to please and what happens over there if krishna doesn't come on time radharani but where were you what were you doing why did you come on time why did you keep me why did you keep me waiting like that because you came late i will not meet you he walks away in a half and then krishna has to go and pacify her krishna has to beg her so actually what is happening over here both their moods are pleasing to krishna So Jyoti Lalamani describes that you know there can be food that is cooked with ghee, and there can be delicacies which are cooked in honey. So the food of cooked in ghee is opulent, but delicacies that are filled with honey or that are made with honey, they are intoxicatingly sweet. So he says Chandravali's love for Krishna is like opulent food, food cooked in ghee. It is grutta prem, and the love of Radharani for Krishna is like a madhu prema it is it is like honey so both are opulent both are pleasing to krishna but the uh, the mood is different so now radharani is considered superior because as i said in the spiritual world love reigns supreme love reigns supreme and how the supreme lord also subordinates to the love of his devotees that is demonstrated in how radharani gets angry and sometimes krishna has to beg to her to pass to be pacified so there is a place in barsana in vrinda near vrindavan which is called mana mandir and in that mana mandir it is described how krishna touched his feet touched his head to the feet of radharani now when jayadev goswami he was envisioning this past time which is given good git govinda i cannot write this he says everybody wants to touch the feet of god how can god touch anyone's feet so he is was disturbed he said i cannot write this and then he, he went to bathe he said he told his wife that i am going to bathe and then within a few minutes he came back he said you came back so quickly his wife asked you know i just felt inspired i had to write something and he came and wrote and after writing he again said i'll go out and come back and after that again he came back he said i just know you had come he said what just now i had gone to bathe i'm just coming back now what but somebody had come just now and then he went inside and he saw that in his book that same passage about krishna touching his head radharani's feet which he had hesitated to write it had been written over there and he understood that it is actually krishna who had come in his form that krishna had come in the form of jayadev goswami 
and he had written that down and his wife had actually served food not to jayadev goswami thought it's my husband who's come but actually krishna himself had come he served food to him and then jayadev goswami understood that this particular past time revealing it to the world was the lord's desire the lord wanted the world to know sita uh, radharani's greatness and thus he himself came and wrote that which jayadev goswami was hesitant to write so the mood is that radharani sometimes may there may be a small cause krishna is a little late but radharani gets very angry with it so it's almost like anger without cause but even when it's anger without cause it is actually pleasing to krishna the uh, the uh, in life often when we try to get into cause you know why did this happen why did this happen why is this person behaving like this why is this person behaving like that now causes are very difficult to find no it's the why question in life often has no answers if we focus on the causes of things we'll just get endlessly entangled so why did this happen why did that happen rather than the cause we can focus on the purpose cause means why did this happen purpose means what is this serving so if you keep the purpose in mind ultimately everything in that happens in this world is meant to help us move to closer to krishna it is meant to help us attain krishna if we keep that purpose in mind then we will be able to move forward steadily so the cause may or may not be there why is radharani getting angry but the purpose is the pleasure of krishna so krishna is pleased by the submission of chandravali and krishna is pleased also by the contrary behavior of radharani where radharani is not very easily pleased and krishna has to has to go out of his way to please her so if we consider in the dwarka leela this demanding nature is seen in satyabhama and the submissive nature is seen in rukmini so in that sense jiva swami says that actually uh, it is chandravali who is manifesting as rukmini and it is uh, radharani who is manifesting as satyabhama so the point here is that kama krodha these are normally considered undesirable but in the spiritual world if they intensify our love for krishna then they are considered auspicious they considered supremely auspicious not only auspicious they are considered exalted and same way uh, that which is considered very unpalatable in this world Uh, that is considered supremely palate perishable in the spiritual world that is separation and when two people love each other they find separation from each other unbearable you know they just want to be there always with each other and they're going away they cry tears and they somehow try to be together go here go there so separation is considered very painful especially if you love someone then and that person goes away it becomes very painful Now, in the case of Krishna, when he gets separated from his devotees, at one level, that is painful for his devotees. It is painful for him also, but it is not just painful, because what happens is when it comes to Krishna, Krishna is not just one person present in one form place. Yes, he is one person, but Krishna is also the all-pervading Lord. and is present in the hearts of his devotees also so when the devotee is with krishna there is intense absorption in krishna but when the devotee is separated from krishna at that time there is even greater absorption because the devotee just when is krishna going to come back where is krishna where is krishna in the padyavali which is a compilation of verses prabhupad calls it an anthology that means verses drawn from different sources they are put together by rupa goswami in a book called padyavali some of those verses are attributed to certain sources and some of them are from unknown sources so in the padyavali it is described one verse radharani is praying she says that actually as compared to union with krishna i prefer separation from krishna why is that he says because in union with krishna i see him only at one place 
But in separation from Krishna, I see him everywhere. I see him everywhere. So the intensity of the longing becomes increased. The absorption becomes increased. And thus, actually, the devotee goes higher and higher into the state of pure love for God. See, pure love can have various meanings. Pure love can mean that we have no material expectation from the Lord. But it is not just material expectation. Pure love is, is so can be so pure that there is not even spiritual expectation from the Lord. That at least I'm offering my whole life to the Lord. At least the Lord should reciprocate. The Lord should reveal Himself to me. No, not even that. That utterly no expectation. Ashlishava padatam pinashtumam. Adarshanam marmahatam karotuva. Yathathava vidhatulam patu mat prananathas tu sakivanapara. That the person to whom I give my heart. If that person casts away my heart, tramples on my heart, breaks my heart, still he remains the Lord of my heart. That is the exalted nature of the love of Radharani for Krishna, which Chaitanya Mahaprabhu conveys in the Shikshashtakam, which he has composed when he is in Gambhira, deeply absorbed in the mood of Radharani during his manifested pastimes in this world in Puri. So the gopis when Krishna is reciprocating with them by manifesting before them, there is reciprocation. But when Krishna leaves them and goes away, there is no reciprocation. In a sense, Krishna is not there. And yet they stay completely devoted to the Lord. That is the, that is the totally selfless nature of their love. In the Chaitanya Charita Amrut, it is said that Krishna, Radharani is again praying that Krishna, when you left this body, when you left Vrindavan, life left my body. I would have died at that time. Radharani is praying, but I, I cannot die. So my condition is, is, is like uh, there is a cage. And in that cage there is an animal. And that cage is set on fire. Now if there is a door that is open, and the animal will flee from that door. From the open door. But if the door is locked, then the animal just burns and burns and burns. So she says that Krishna, when you left Vrindavan, it was like life left my body. The fire of separation from you is burning my heart. But you know, your words. I will come back. Those words are like the latch to the cage. By those words, I am bound to stay here and wait for you. So the Radharani's mood is, if without Krishna, what is the use of my life? I will give up my life right now. But she thinks that if I give up my life and Krishna comes back, and Krishna says that I am not there to serve him. Krishna will be unhappy. And I cannot tolerate Krishna's unhappiness. Therefore, although separation from Krishna is causing me great agony, but because I want to serve Krishna, in future, whenever the opportunity comes, at that time I should be there to serve him. And therefore, I will maintain my life. So the fire of separation, Radharani says this, burning me like an animal getting burnt in a cage. But it is burning, it is not killing. Because we are staying alive so that we can serve you. So this total selflessness of the gopis, and especially of Radharani for Krishna, that is the zenith of love. kataram <laughs> When Madhavendra Puri was departing from the world, at that time he recited this verse. And Chaitanya Tamut says that the more we meditate on this verse, the more we will appreciate the sweetness of love for Krishna. But this verse was actually spoken in the mood of separation of Radharani when Krishna has gone to Mathura. 
ai dina dayardra nath hai oh krishna you are the lord of the fallen people but mathura nath kada va lokke se you have become mathura nath you gone to mathura kada va lokke se when will i be able to see you oh lord rudayam tada lok kataram i'm not being able to see you my heart is afflicted dait brahmyati kim karomya hum oh lord oh beloved what will i do now my mind is wandering helplessly what should i do now so it is a maddened in separation from krishna longing for the return of krishna and that is the highest love so actually in this love the gopis give themselves completely to krishna and this is the love although at external level it may appear very painful the gopis are separated from krishna they are suffering but actually internally they are so greatly absorbed in krishna that they are experiencing the greatest ecstasy and their ecstasy is so great that lord Chait- that lord krishna wants to experience it and thus he takes the form of lord chaitanya and he wants to experience that love not just the love of the gopis for krishna but the love of the gopis when they are feeling separation from krishna so separation does to love what wind does to fire suppose there is a big forest fire and the wind comes then what will happen the wind will cause the fire to spread more and more and more like that for the great devotees their love for krishna is like a big forest fire and when the separation comes that becomes like a wind which spread that forest fire so for the great devotees separation actually intensifies their love now of course our love for krishna is not like a forest fire our love is like a candle and when a wind comes what happens to the candle it gets extinguished so all the love and separation is very exalted you know we shouldn't think oh if i get separated from devotees then my appreciation will increase no it's unlikely if we get separated from devotees then all that will happen is the candle like love of ours will get extinguished so for us we very much need association we need to be as close to krishna as possible but sometimes if somehow circumstances make us distanced we have to go for some service a little away from devotees then if we can have a positive attitude anukulya sa sankalpa favorably we think oh when will i return to the association of devotees when will i get the association of a particular senior devotee when will i be able to be in front of the deities whatever it is that we are hard to attract to if the desire increases then that will purify us that will elevate us and that will take us closer and closer to krishna so just as the gopis were separated from krishna all of us souls in the material world are separated from krishna of course the gopis are separated from krishna by krishna's desire we are separated from krishna by our desire there is a big difference but the principle is that the gopis even in the separation they were in trying to cultivate and they were absorbed in krishna so if we also try to become absorbed in krishna then we also can become purified we also can become elevated and ultimately we also can become liberated shri prabhupada would say that our mood when serving krishna is the mood of separation he say hey radhe vrj devi ke chalite and the goswami is in the said goswami has to come and say hey radha hey krishna hey lalita where are you i am separated from you please reveal yourself so that is the mood which the gaudiya vishnu sampradaya has given and that is the mood in which when we are separated from the lord what do we do we try to remove that separation for the gopis the separation they try to remove by absorption in krishna we also try to remove the abs- separation by absorption in krishna absorption in at our level practical service to krishna so in the I'll conclude with this point in the bhakti samrit sindhu it is said that there are different ways in which you can meditate on krishna there is nama dhyana there is a rupa dhyana there is leela dhyana and there is seva dhyana and we can meditate on the names of krishna we can meditate on the form of krishna we can meditate on the past times of krishna and we can meditate on our service to krishna now unless we are very attached to krishna nama rupa leela the dhyana of this we cannot do much we can chant for some time but afterwards it's enough 
become a deep darshan of Krishna, but how long can we take darshan? Krishna's past times, we hear, but after some time, you know, I've heard the story. We have some news, new story to tell me. You know, we, we cannot really meditate on it for a long time. But seva, service, is something which we can do a lot of dhyana. We can absorb ourselves in Krishna. Now, initially, when we are doing services, we are often very caught in the externals of the service. Oh, you know, I have come to, if I am doing book distribution, I think I have come to this university. There are all young people over here. Oh, I have come to this airport. I have come here. So we are very much caught in the externals when we are doing services. But as we keep doing sadhana bhakti, what happens is that our consciousness goes from the externals towards the internal. Now, where I am serving is not as important as whom I am serving. Mm -hmm. So, that means we will do the same book distribution which we might have been doing when we came new and after 20 years or 30 years. But initially we are very caught in externals, but subsequently we become very caught in internals. Why am I doing this? If you are giving classes, and initially we are very, very conscious, you know, okay, how are people looking at me? How many people are appreciating my classes? You know, am I, am I, am I making good impression or not? Those external will catch us a lot. But if we keep rendering service to Krishna, then, you know, where we are speaking is not as important as for whom we are speaking. We are speaking to glorify Krishna. And when that service is what connects us with Krishna. Now, of course, we want to do the service in such a way that it has the desired result in this world also. So naturally, if you can distribute more books, if you can have more people hearing Krishna, that's wonderful. But for us, service is not just to uh, get things done in this world. Service is also for connecting us with Krishna. Srila Prabhupada, you know, he would speak enthusiastically. Hari Prabhu writes in his Transcendental Diary that whether Prabhupada was speaking in a Pandal program with a thousand people or he was speaking in a private darshan to a half a dozen people. When it came to speaking about Krishna, Prabhupada spoke with the same conviction, the same enthusiasm. Because for him, it was not, he was not just speaking for those people. He was speaking for Krishna. Yes, definitely he was speaking for those people. But his purpose was to connect with Krishna, to serve Krishna. So if we become absorbed in our service to Krishna, then that is the safest way in which we can overcome the separation from Krishna that we may or may not experience, but that we are undergoing right now. So through absorption in service to Krishna, through the seva dhyan, we can move closer and closer to Krishna, and ultimately, we can also attain Krishna. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke about how mm, whatever is present in the material world is present in the spiritual world also. So here, karma and krodha, is to talk about being present. So karma, I talk elaborately. Karma can refer to lust. It can also refer generically to, de generically to desire. And karma can also be purushartha, one of the goals of life. And um, uh, karma is used in the positive sense also in the scriptures. So when it is said the gopis are attracted to Krishna through karma, what does it mean? It means that specifically all their power of desire is concentrated in Krishna. And further it means that the power of their attraction to Krishna is supreme. And because they are in female form, they serve Krishna in a particular way. The important thing is the attitude of service. So that's when you have some of the gopis were rishis and in the previous life, and they were also serving Krishna at that time. So whatever is present in this world is there in, this pure, in the spiritual world, but it is in its pure form. So Krodha is also there, but the Krodha is in such a way that it increases Krishna's it is for Krishna's pleasure. So the devotee gets angry because that anger will please Krishna. We talk about the two different moods in which Satya Bhama and uh, Rukmini serve and corresponding Radharani and uh, Chandravali also serve. And uh, so this calm and Krodha which are considered to be undesirable in the material world, but they are actually, if they enhance the remembrance of Krishna, they are desirable. Like that. Same way, separation from Krishna is undesirable in this, separation from our loved one is undesirable in this world. But in the spiritual world, separation intensifies remembrance. And in that sense, uh, the separation means that we are getting no reciprocation from our Lord. Neither material reciprocation nor spiritual reciprocation. The Lord is not present. 
But still we keep loving him. That means the love is totally selfless, is supremely exalted. And the gopis exhibit that kind of love for Krishna. And, and so separation is like fire. Separa uh, separation is to love what wind is to fire. So when the wind is, when the fire is small, it will get extinguished. When the fire is big, it will like blaze further. So for the gopis whose love is very big, separation intensifies their love. For us, it will actually suppress our love. So, but inevitably, when we cannot do Nama Dhyan, Rupa Dhyan, Dila Dhyan, instead of simply feeling separation from Krishna, we can see our service also as a contemplation on Krishna. So Dhyan on Krishna. And through service, we become absorbed in Him. And if we are doing our sadhana bhakti nicely, then even if our service seems to be in external circumstances, but our shift, consciousness will shift from where we are serving to whom we are serving. And thus we will become more and more Krishna conscious even when we are not in a Krishna conscious setting. And that absorption in Krishna, in separation from Him, is the test of our love and is ultimately the zenith of pure love for Krishna. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So do we have any comments or questions? The, the love of the gopis, uh, these liberated souls, it seems so incomprehensible and unattainable, like they're in this exclusive category. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, exclusive category. Is it that, what is it? Um, are they wired that way to be naturally spontaneous in their love, unlike us? Could you say something about okay. that, that type of love? So are the gopis love seems so exalted, so incomprehensible. So are they wired like that naturally? Um, not necessarily. There are different categories of gopis. There are some which are nitya siddha. They are eternally associated with Krishna. There are many which are sadhana siddha. Become purified and enter into Krishna Lila. So, Madhvacharya and their sampradaya consider the gopis, they explain gopya kamad. They say that this refers to, actually they are the heavenly apsaras. That when Krishna was performing pastimes, they became materially attracted to Krishna. And then they came to the world as the gopis, in this world, and then they were attracted and they attained Krishna. That's, that's their, their explanation. So our Acharya has explained that, that is one, one, one kind of gopis. The apsaras may have come out of kama and they got attracted to Krishna. But um, the progression in love, specifically the level of the love of the gopis for Krishna, that may seem to be, as I said, incomprehensible. But it's a progression. You know, from where we are, if we just keep taking steps forward, it's like every morning when the sun is rising. You know, it's dark, it's dark, it's dark, and suddenly at one moment, hey, it's light. So, the sun is continuously rising, but the realization that the sun has risen comes at one particular moment. So like that, just by doing sadhana bhakti, we are getting purified every day that we are doing sadhana bhakti. The sun is rising, the sun is rising. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prem Sadhya Kabunai Shravanadi Shuddha Chitte Karaya Udaya By hearing and chanting Karaya Udaya, it rises in our heart. So at one particular point we will realize, oh, the sun has risen. You know, actually, yes, I'm absorbed in Krishna. I don't know anything other than Krishna in my life. He is my be all and end all. So even if that specific mellow or intensity of love um, for the gopis for Krishna may not be accessible to everyone. But the principle of absorption in Krishna is accessible for everyone. And Krishna in that sense does not deprive himself from anyone. So, in the Brihad Bhagavata Amrita, it is described that when the Gopa Kumara goes to the spiritual world, so first he goes to Ayodhya, first he goes to Vaikuntha, then he goes to Ayodhya, then he goes to Dwarka, then he comes back to this world, and then he goes to Vrindavan, Gulok Vrindavan. So now it's insignificant that he himself is not satisfied in Dwarka, he's not satisfied in Ayodhya. But 
the ayodhya vasis are fully satisfied the dwarka vasis are fully satisfied and actually the dwarka vasis think that dwarka krishna is the greatest the ayodhya vasis think that ram is the greatest they think that actually other avatars come from ram and drupa goswami or rather sanatan goswami does not say that oh, they are wrong gopakumar doesn't get into an argument say they are wrong there is transcendental subject transcendental subjectivity wherein there it's a matter of rasa so for the ayodhya vasis to think that ram is the supreme lord is actually an ornament it's a bhushana it is the intensity of their love because of it they can think of no lord other than ram hmm. in the uh, in the venkatesh suprabhatam which is a traditional prayer offered to lord venkatesh there are two verses in one verse it is said that i don't know any lord other than ram and next verse it is i don't know any lord other than krishna and both of them are composed with the same poet so what does it mean actually the devotee in different moods gets attracted to different manifestations of manifestations of the lord and one is attracted thus one is completely satisfied in their attraction so the point is that the gopi's specific love may be inconceivable for us but the principle of absorption in their love is something which we all can learn and yes we may not have that spontaneous attraction right now but the process of sadhana bhakti has the potency to transform to redirect and to elevate us okay so next one okay i heard i was listening to the class earlier and i'm not sure if you've answered my question but um you were saying about <coughs> describing the difference between satyabhama and rukmini and how normally qualities that are considered inauspicious in the material world uh if they're in connection with krishna are considered very auspicious if it brings if, for instance you were saying how radharani and satyabhama they become very mind they become very like uh they reject krishna sometimes and um but because it actually just increases krishna's happiness increases increases his pleasure um so i'm curious in terms of our own situation if for instance sometimes one may come across um times in their spiritual life when they uh get caught up in sinful activities and if these sinful activities then prove to bring one closer to krishna do those sinful activities become auspicious or and how do you determine hmm. so if sometimes if connection with krishna makes the inauspicious auspicious then if sometimes if somebody gets caught in sinful activities uh, is that also auspicious See, when there are two aspects in our life there's something which we do and something that happens to us Mm-hmm. so generally what we do we are responsible for that so everything that happens is not necessarily good it's not necessarily good it's not necessarily good bad things also happen in this world but everything that happens can be for good that means krishna can bring good even out of the bad so sometimes So I'll give two examples from different perspectives. You know, we know the famous past time when Durvasamani came to the Pandavas when they were in the forest, and they had he came after they had eaten all their food, so they had no food available for him. So then what happened was Krishna came over them. Krishna told uh, Draupadi, "Get some. Just see if there's any food on the plate, magical plate, Akshay Patra. There's a little morsel over there." And he, Krishna took that, and by that he satisfied everyone. now uh, we may uh, the question may come up you know what was that morsel of food doing over there there is a precious plate normally you know if we have if we have a golden plate or something like that we we'll be very careful to clean it we want to keep a morsel of food over there lying over there and this is not just a golden plate this is a vital plate needed for them it was all that dharma was being done by that magical plate it was a plate which is gifted by the by surya dev to them sun god to them so how was the morsel left over there we could say it was somebody's carelessness or somebody's mistake dropati was overseeing it so one of our sir made sir one might have made the mistake she herself might have left it like that so we could say it's a leela of the lord we could say it is a mistake 
But Krishna brought good even out of that. The point is that Krishna can bring good even out of the bad if we stay fixed in our service to him. But this is with respect to what happens to us. Now, in contrast, what we do, sometimes if we get caught in something which is mundane, something which is sensual, something which is sinful, then there is a significant element of our free will involved over there also. And we can't just simply say that it is, it is good. It is bad. But sometimes, through, the, through going through that, we get certain essential realizations. So, in a sense, like you had said that you know, the love for Krishna is like a snake. And a snake doesn't move straight. A snake moves slither like that. So, like that, similarly, sometimes we don't progress necessarily linearly. Say, if temptation confronts me, and if I say no to the temptation, then I may say I win. And if I say yes to the temptation, I lose. But it's not that simple. If I say no to the temptation, but that makes me proud, thinking I am so renounced, then actually I may have lost that battle. I have won the battle against a lust or greed, but I have lost the battle against pride. On the other hand, when the temptation comes and I succumb to it, but after succumbing to it, you know, I, I realize desperately my need for Krishna. And then that makes me more dependent on Krishna, that makes me take shelter of Krishna more intensely. Then there is a, we lost the battle against temptation, but we notched a victory in the war for devotion. The two are related, but two are not the same. The battle against temptation and the war for devotion. The two are related, but they are not the same. Normally, the more we win in the battle against temptation, the more we also win the war for devotion. Because temptation takes us away from Krishna, devotion takes us towards Krishna. But sometimes the two may work contrary. If, by losing the battle against temptation, if that makes me humble, that makes me more dependent on Krishna, that makes me in a position where I take more shelter of Krishna. Then that is like notching a victory in the war, of, war for devotion. So, you know, whatever happens in our life, in terms of something beyond our control, just happens to us, or something which we have also done in the past. We can try to learn from it, but ultimately we have to know that Krishna can bring good out of even the bad. And we try to do the best that we can now. So, even if somebody has done something wrong, something sinful, or something very bad, but then maybe that can become a means by which they take more shelter of Krishna. And in going through that experience, helps them to become more empathic when they are trying to share Krishna and with others. And how difficult it is to deal with temptation. What are the ways in which temptation attacks? How it overcomes? How we can resist it? So, basically, if we, keep, if we stay fixed in the principle of serving Krishna, then even if bad things happen, whether they happen in terms of things beyond our control happening or some bad things happen by our own doing bad things also, if we can take shelter of Krishna with a consistent attitude, then Krishna will bring good out of that bad. So Krishna will bring auspiciousness ultimately. Now, there are three ways of looking at it. One is that, that event that happened itself is auspicious, but I'm not able to understand it. Hmm? Second is that, that event made me take shelter of Krishna. And in that sense, it is auspicious. Hmm? So it's like, hmm, the two different things. One is, okay, bad thing happened, but I found out later it was not bad, actually it was good only. Okay, you know, I was in a particular project and somebody, like Prabhupada, and he was in the League of Devotees and there was a conspiracy against him and he was driven out of Jhansi. It was a bad thing, the whole conspiracy. But then, Jhansi was a small place without much potential. And Prabhupada came to Delhi, Prabhupada came to Mumbai and he eventually came to America. So that bad thing itself is turned out, it, we realized at that time it appeared bad, but later on it was actually good. Hmm? That's one level. The other level is, it is bad, it is a bad thing that happened, uh, but that bad thing made me do something good. One is the bad thing itself led to something good. 
in terms of situation that a better plan is available. Other is the bad thing is bad, but it leads me to something good. Because of that bad thing, I take shelter of Krishna. And the shelter of Krishna is good. So it's like, say somebody gets terminal disease. That's a bad thing. Their, their life is cut short over there. But how that is good, that itself may be bad in terms of their practical service in this world. But if that makes them take shelter of Krishna, that is good. Mm -hmm. And mm, the third level is that actually there's a bad thing that happens and that makes us do bad things in return. That makes us do bad things in return. Some people, when adversity has happened in their life, they become bitter. Hmm? Why did this happen to me? Or sometimes even if we do wrong things, sometimes because of some pressure of emotions. So you know, what is it if, if after practicing bhakti also such desires are coming in my life, so what is the use of practicing bhakti? And I give up practicing bhakti. So the bad things are really bad only when they take us away from Krishna. But if they can take us towards Krishna, then either they are they themselves are good or they make us do something good. And in that sense they are auspicious. So that's why the basic principle of bhakti is that yena kena prakarana mana krishna Somehow or other fix the mind on Krishna. Sometimes in the force of passion, force of temptation that comes in a particular situation, we may not be able to take shelter of Krishna. But what do we do after that? I'll conclude with one example. Say, somebody has fallen in a well. And somebody from above has offered a rope. And with that rope, they're trying to pull this person out. And there is some person below who wants to keep this person in the, in the well itself. And they are catching the person from below. Now this person is caught in a tug of war. There is someone pulling above and there is someone pulling below. So that is our condition. You know, we are in the middle, our own past conditionings, our own mind and senses, they are pulling us down. And Krishna is pulling us up. Now, sometimes our conditionings may pull us so forcefully that despite our best efforts, we are dragged down. The force is so great, we are dragged down. So what happens at that time? There's a force which is pulling us down. And when we are dragged down, we become so disheartened that we go let go of the upper rope. Now actually the upper rope is extendable. Even when I go down, I may be pulled down. But I don't have to let go of that rope. So our conditionings may hold on to us, but we can still hold on to Krishna. But unfortunately what happens, when our conditionings pull us down, we also let go of Krishna. Because in a sense, in the conditionings catch us, you know, lust may catch us, me, anger may catch me. It's not going to obsess me 24 hours a day. The desire comes, I do something. But what after that? Anger comes. So it's after that we become so disheartened because of that, that we give up Krishna Bhakti. But if you don't do that, okay, that thing happened, whatever happened, it's bad, but I'm not going to give up Krishna Bhakti. So I was pulled down. This is the normal level of moral, spiritual behavior I was supposed to be at. But my conditioning pulled me down to this very bad level. But just because I was pulled from here to here, doesn't mean I have to give up the upper rope. The upper rope can extend till here also. So if I just hold on, if we just hold on to Krishna, even if our conditioning are holding on to us, then what will happen gradually, as we keep practicing bhakti, the conditionings their force will go down over a period of time. And then because we have held on to the rope, this rope by which we can be pulled out. So as devotees, we can't predict how temptation is going to attack us in future. And today I may say I'm very pure and I'm not going to fall for temptation, but tomorrow I may fall. But what we can do is that, okay, temptation comes, temptation goes. But what do we hold on to Krishna? So if we hold on to Krishna, then Krishna will ultimately bring auspiciousness in our life. Okay? So, thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai Gaur Bhakta Vrind Ki Jai Skond Enver Bhakta Vrind Ki Jai Jai Gaur Pramandi His Grace Chaitanya Chandra Prabhu Ki Jai Let's have a Hari Bol for Prabhu and his 11 classes over the last week. Hari Bol! Hari Bol! Jai Jai Jai